Good afternoon and welcome to Across the Fence. I'm Jolay Whitney. It might feel a little early in the year to talk about Vermont's signature agricultural product, maple, but at UVM Extension we think it's an always, good always a good time to talk maple. This time of year, most sugar makers are getting ready to collect their first sap of the season, and some have already begun the sweet journey from sap to syrup. Joining me in the studio is Mark Isselhart, UVM Extension's maple specialist. Mark is based at the Pro Proctor Maple Research Facility in Underhill. Thank you for talking with me today. Happy to be here. So we talk about maybe the traditional syrup or the sap season maybe being from March to April, but a lot of people have started tapping in December. Can you tell me what that, what caused that? Yeah, I would say not a lot of people tap in December, <coughs> excuse me, but the really large operations, just because the fact that they have tens of thousands of taps and only a certain number of people they can hire to do that hard work, find themselves having to tap earlier than, than normal. We see the average producer is starting to produce syrup in February, which is Definitely something, uh, a departure a little bit from tradition, but it's been, February syrup production has been happening for a while. And you mentioned a large producer. What would define a large producer here in Vermont? Yeah, we don't actually have a definition of what a large producer is. Sometimes it's relative uh, to, to what you experience. Historically, a few thousand taps was a decent sized operation. We're seeing new businesses from starting from scratch with 25, 50,000 taps and, and more. And that is a bit of a change for sure than, than what we had historically seen. It's just a business decision that they make and, and if the, the numbers seem to work for them, that's the scale they're gonna jump into. All right, and this early tapping, is that a result of climate change? Is it something we should be worried about? So we are definitely seeing the season start earlier. And by that, I mean a few weeks earlier. So February syrup is definitely something we expect at this point, whereas it wasn't that common maybe 30, 40, 50 years ago. But we're not really seeing a huge amount uh, in January and February. And so I think there's definitely a climate change signal going on, but two months early is really more of a business decision for these really large operations. It does get a lot of attention though when you hear about syrup made in December or, or January. And to kind of continue with that, we actually just had a January thaw. Is that something that here in Vermont people were sugaring during? If so, a tree is um, a dormant tree will react to the temperatures in which it finds itself. And if the tree is tapped and thawed out enough, you will get some sap flow. It won't be a lot of sap, and typically the sap will be much less sweet than we would see during the bulk of the season. And so, most producers would never even harvest any sap because they're not tapped yet. Again, if you have tens of thousands of taps, even a little bit of sap is going to add up to be enough that you need to boil. So it's not really the, the thing that most producers want to do when they're really just trying to get all the leaks fixed and trees tapped. All right, just trying to get a jump on the season instead of really producing. Right, it, it becomes a kind of a byproduct. Uh, you know, obviously their crew would really be dialed into tapping and making repairs. Um, but when the tree experiences warm temperatures, that will flow. It won't have the magnitude of the runs that we see later in the season. So it's not a full-fledged start of the season. The tree is just responding to the temperatures in which it find it finds itself. All right, and you mentioned the sap would be less sweet. Does that mean the sugar is going to be, or the syrup is going to be less sweet? Nope. By law, all the syrup has to be boiled to a certain a certain density, and that's fixed uh, by regulation. What's different and what's dynamic is the sap sweetness. So early in the season, it tends to be lower. A lot of people might think 40 gallons of sap to make a gallon of syrup. And that might be generally true when the sap is, say, 2%. But early season sap might be only 1% or less. Now you're talking 80 or more gallons to make a single gallon of syrup. It just means more energy, more more evaporation. Sure, so it might not even be financially worth it to boil at that point. It's, they're gonna do it, even sure. if, <laughs> if you know, the bulk of the season is Absolutely. gonna be more typical for sap sweetness, so I don't think they're too worried, but it does take a lot to, to get to those first few gallons. Absolutely, and we talk about climate resilience a lot here on the show, but it's also really important in the maple industry. What does that look like for sugaring? Yeah, so it, it's a unique product, right? We're talking about a perennial plant, it's living year after year, sugar, maker, uh, sugar maples can live for 250, 300 years. So we really need to be thoughtful about maintaining tree health. Historically, when you were collecting sap with a bucket, it meant that you had to go to every tree and empty that sap every day that there was sap. Now with tubing, it relieves some of that effort, but 
the way we manage our sugar bushes are also going to change. When you're carrying buckets through the woods, you didn't want to have to walk through a lot of uh, understory vegetation, maybe you had horses or other things. Now with tubing, we can allow the forest to be a little bit more natural in terms of its structure. So more complex structure, newer, smaller, younger age trees ready to occupy when the older trees die. Um, just more complexity, uh, more diversity in the woods for sure. We see many more sugar makers tapping a red maple than ever before. Red maple is a different species, uh, also within the, the maple genus. And it provides a diversity, can break up some of the threats from some defoliating insects. And you mentioned a lot of that newer technology kind of coming into play, and the state of Vermont provided some grants for, for sugarers um, over the last few years to kind of increase that. Is it going to become the case where if you don't have those infrastructure improvements, you won't be able to compete in the market? It's difficult because most of the sap, uh, or sorry, and syrup in Vermont is sold in the form of bulk syrup, so it's sold in a barrel to other businesses that buy from many different farms and, and package that syrup. Individual producers are free to sell their syrup directly to consumers, and it really comes down to their cost of production. If they have a market, have a relationship with their consumers, um, it may be fine to, to do that. Uh, a lot of people use reverse osmosis. It's a really important tool for reducing the costs of produ producing. About atmospheric boiling, just as we kind of picture it, is very energy intensive. And what reverse osmosis does is take some of that water, a lot of that water out of the sap before you have to boil. You still have to have heat, you still have to have an evaporator to produce color and flavor that we associate with, with high quality syrup. So, so, but even, even relatively small operations are using this technology now. And you mentioned like reverse osmosis and maybe more efficient evaporators. Is that helping to combat climate change as well? You could say so. I mean, definitely the less boiling you have to do, that's less uh, in emissions going into the atmosphere. If you're using wood or uh, fuel oil, those are the two most common fuel sources. It just means you're burning less fuel. So that's definitely a positive. Um, you can, you could argue that um, allowing larger operations to be more viable, given this technology, more forest is being retained, and there's all sorts of benefits for sugar bushes in terms of largely mature or maturing forests that provide all these ecosystem services in addition to this crop. And so any technology that allows maple to be produced is going to allow a larger amount of the landscape to be in production. And we had mentioned a lot earlier in the program about a, a 40 to 1 ratio, 40 gallons of sap to one gallon of syrup. Is this new technology making that ratio any different? Uh, nope. No, it really isn't. Other than the fact, like I said, early season sap will typically be low. It'll come to some sort of high point in the middle of the season, then drop off again near the end. Um, you could argue that the new technology allows earlier tapping, so maybe you collect some of that early crop low sugar sap, but it's not changing the ratio. The tree's response to the environment is really what's driving the sap sweetness. And what's a healthy sugar bush look like? Right. So people might picture in their mind sort of widely spaced, large crowned sugar maples. And, and that was really the approach when you had to go and get sap from individual trees each day. You know, most producers would rather go to fewer trees. And, and that meant that these wider spaced trees were really the way they would approach sugar bush management. Now we know a lot more about healthy forest ecosystems and what's, what those look like. Typically, they might even look a little bit messy. You know, you've got more down woody debris. It's not impairing sugar makers from walking around, but it allows for more complexity in what's decomposing into the soils. It's retaining water uh, rather than letting it run off when there's no vegetation there. And definitely a more diverse forest. So not just purely sugar maple, sugar maple, maybe red maple, and then some other species, tends to be more resilient in the face of, of natural disturbances and, and, and other issues.
And you mentioned those down trees, and in, especially over this last the last couple of months, we had a big storm in December, and even last year we've had a bunch of wind storms. Have Maple Farms seen an impact from that? Absolutely, and it, it is definitely uh, wherever you're located, you might have a different experience. So the two storm wind events that we saw uh, earlier in the year, the west side of Mansfield, along the Greens, definitely saw a, a bigger impact of wind. Just on the other side of the Green Mountains, it was relatively light winds. At the Maple Research Center in Underhill, we lost about 20 crop trees. And, and this is a big loss because, although it's not a huge percentage, it, th those are trees that were producing year after year. Now you're gonna have to wait for a new individual to get established and occupy that space. It's not like an annual crop where we're putting in new seeds next season. It's, it's really a lot of management and focus on individual crop trees growing for a long time. I know other operations have, were hit harder, so uh, hopefully they'll be able to recover in time. And a lot of your research talks about how there, a, a day or two can make or break the season, like one or two days in, in March, so to speak. Um, is that a result of climate change or is that just part of the business? It's always been that way. We have what are called sap runs, and these are really short duration, relatively short duration flow events. And they don't happen throughout the season. They come periodically. Sometimes they're evenly distributed throughout the season. Sometimes they're clustered in the front or the back of the season. But it's not like sap starts flowing day one and runs all the way through the season and then ends. You have these little kind of episodes of sap flow. And if something happens with the weather and you don't get one or two, that can be the difference of 10 or 20 percent of your crop. On the other side, if you get lots of them, it can be a really good crop. So everyone wants to know how the season is going to turn out. We really won't know until May or when, when the, the last bit of sap flows, but it absolutely makes a difference how many of those sap runs you get. And we've talked about some larger scale businesses to maybe smaller. How about a backyard sugar? Or have they been feeling the impacts of, of climate at all? Um, I guess it depends on, on how they're, if they're choosing to tap just based on, you know, the historical time or if they really pay attention to the weather in their location. Typically they won't miss out if they're really looking at, okay, I've got a handful of trees, the weather lo forecast looks good, they should be okay. Um, as long as they're not using just the calendar to decide when to tap, they're probably going to be okay. Great. Thank you so much for joining us today, Mark. Happy to be here. To keep up with the sugaring season and to learn more about the topics we've discussed today, visit the website on your screen. My thanks to everyone here at WCAX for their help behind the scenes. I'm Jolay Whitney. Have a good one. Mm -hmm.